The Bean Trees by Barbara Kingsolver Chapter 16 Soundness of Mind and Freedom of Will Mr. Jonas Wilford Armistead was a tall, white-haired man who seemed more comfortable with the notarizing part of his job than with the public. Even though he had been forewarned, when all of us came trooping into his office, he seemed overwhelmed and showed a tendency to dither. He moved papers and pens and framed pictures from one side of his desk to the other and wouldn't sit down until all of us could be seated, which, unfortunately, didn't happen for quite a while because there weren't enough chairs. Mr. Armistead sent his secretary, Mrs. Cleary, next door to, be, to borrow a chair from the real estate office of Mr. Wren. Mr. Armistead wore a complicated hearing aid that had ear parts and black and white wires and a little silver box that had to be placed for maximum effectiveness on exactly the right spot on his desk, which he seemed unable to find. If he ever did, I thought I might suggest to him that he mark this special zone with paint as they do on a basketball court. The silver box had tiny controls along one side, and Mr. Armistead also fiddled with these almost constantly, apparently without much success. Mrs. Cleary seemed, during their working coexistence, to have adjusted her volume accordingly. Even when she was talking to us, she practically shouted. It had an intimidating effect, especially on Esperanza. But we all managed small talk while we waited, which was all the more admirable when you considered that not one word any of us was saying was true, so far as I know. Estefan was an astonishingly good liar, going into great detail about the Oklahoma town where he and his wife had been living and the various jobs he'd had. I talked about my plans to move to Arizona to live with my sister and her little boy. I think we were all amazed by the things that were popping out of our heads like corn. Sister, indeed. I remember begging my mother for a sister when I was very young. She'd said she was all for it but that if I got one, it would have to be arranged by means of a miracle. At the time, I had no idea what she meant. Now, I knew about celibacy. Mrs. Cleary returned in due time, rolling a chair on its little wheels, and asked several questions about what forms would need to be typed up. We shuffled around again as we made room for Estefan and the new chair, and Mr. Armistead finally agreed to come down from his great height and roost like a long-legged stork on the chair behind his desk. It became necessary to make formal arrangements, Estefan explained, because our friend is leaving the state. Esperanza nodded. Mr. and Mrs. Tutu, do you understand that this is a permanent agreement? He spoke very so slowly, the way people often speak to not very bright children and foreigners. Although I'm positive that Mr. Armistead had no inkling that the Tutu family came from any farther away than the Cherokee Nation. They nodded again. Esperanza was holding Turtle tightly in her arms and beginning to get tears in her eyes. Already it was clear that, of the three of us, she was first in line for the Oscar nomination. He went on. After about six months, a new birth certificate will be issued, and the old one destroyed. After that, you cannot change your minds for any reason. This is a very serious decision. There wasn't any birth certificate issued, Miss Cleary shouted. It was born on tribal lands. She, I said, in a Plymouth, I added. We understand, Estefan said. I just want to make absolutely certain. We know Taylor very well, Estefan replied. We know she will make a good mother to this child. Even though they were practically standing on it, Mr. Armistead and Mrs. Cleary seemed to think of tribal land as some distant, vaguely civilized country. This, to them, explained everything including the fact that Hope, Stephen, and Turtle had no identification other than a set of black and white souvenir pictures taken of the three of them at Lake of the Cherokees. 
It was enough that I, a proven citizen with a social security card, was willing to swear on pain of I don't know what, assign documents to that effect, that they were all who they said they were. By this point, we had run out of small talk. I was over my initial nervousness, but without it, I felt drained. Just sitting in that small, crowded office, trying to look the right way and say the right thing, seemed to take a great deal of energy. I couldn't imagine how we were all going to get through this. We love her, but we cannot take care of her, Esperanza said suddenly. Her accent was complicated by the fact that she was crying, but it didn't faze Mr. Armistead or Mrs. Cleary. Possibly they thought it was a Cherokee accent. We've talked it over, I said. I began to worry a little about what was going on here. We love her. Maybe someday we will have more children, but not now. Now is so hard. We move around so much. We have nothing, no home. Esperanza was sobbing. This was no act. Estefan handed her a handkerchief, and she held it to her face. Chai, Ma? Turtle said. That's right, Turtle, I said quietly. She's crying. Estefan reached over and lifted Turtle out of her arms. He stood her up, her small blue sneakers set firmly on his knees, and held her gently by the shoulders and looked into her eyes. You must be a good girl, remember, good and strong, like your mother. I wondered which mother he meant. There were so many possibilities. I was touched to think he might mean me. Okay, Turtle said. He handed her carefully back to Esperanza, who folded her arms around Turtle and held her against her chest, rocking back and forth for a very long time, with her eyes squeezed shut. Tears drained down the shallow creases in her cheeks. The rest of us watched. Mr. Armistead stopped fidgeting. Mrs. Cleary's hands on her papers went still. Here were a mother and her daughter, nothing less, a mother and child, in a world that could barely be bothered with mothers and children, who were going to be taken apart. Everybody believed it. Possibly Turtle believed it. I did. Of all the many times when it seemed to be so, that was the only moment in which I really came close to losing Turtle. I couldn't have taken her from Esperanza. If she had asked, I couldn't have said no. When she let go, letting Turtle sit gently back on her lap, Turtle had the sniffles. Esperanza wiped Turtle's nose with Estefan's big handkerchief and kissed her on both cheeks. Then she unclasped the gold medallion of St. Christopher, guardian saint of refugees, and put it around Turtle's neck. Then she gave Turtle to me. Esperanza told me, We will know she is happy and growing with a good heart. Thank you, I said. There was nothing else I could say. It took what seemed like an extremely long time to draw up a statement, which Mrs. Cleary shuttled off to type. She came back and was sent off twice more to make repairs. After several rounds of whiteout, we had managed to create an official document. We, the undersigned, Mr. Stephen Tilpeck Tutu and Mrs. Hope Roberta Tutu, being the sworn natural parents of April Turtle Tutu, do hereby grant custody of our only daughter to Mrs. to Ms. Taylor Marietta Greer, who will from this day forward become her sole guardian and parent. We do solemnly swear and testify to our soundness of mind and freedom of will. Signed before witnesses on this blank day of blank in the office of Jonas Wilford Armistead, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Mrs. Cleary went off again, to Mr. Wren's office, this time to borrow his secretary, Miss Brindo, to be a second witness to the signing. Miss Brindo, who appeared to have at least enough Cherokee in her to claim head rights, had on tight jeans and shiny red high heels and snapped her gum. 
She had a complicated haircut that stood straight up on top, and something told me she led a life that was way too boring for her potential. I wish she could have known what she was really witnessing that morning. In a way, I wish all of them could know, maybe twenty years later or so, when it's long past doing anything about it. Mrs. Cleary's and Mr. Armistead's hair would have stood straight up, too, to think what astonishing things could be made legal in a modest little office in the state of Oklahoma. We shook hands all around. I got the rest of the adoption arrangements, straightened out with Mr. Armistead, and we filed out, a strange new combination of friends and family. I could see the relief across Estefan's back and shoulders. He held Esperanza's hand. She was still drying tears, but her face was changed. It shone like a polished thing, something old made new. They both wore clean work shirts, light blue with faded elbows. Esperanza had on a worn denim shirt and flat loafers. I had asked them, please, to not wear their very best for this occasion, not their immigration fooling clothes. It had to look like Turtle was going to be better off with me. When they came out that morning dressed as refugees, I had wanted to cry out. No, I was wrong. Don't sacrifice your pride for me. But this is how badly they wanted to make it work.